Hello and welcome to the latest episode of The Brass Junkies. I almost said The Entrepreneurial Musician. There was a little pause there and that was that hitch in my giddy up there was me almost announcing the wrong podcast because it's after 11. I I do and you just heard the hitch. So um, my name is Andrew Hitz and I am the host of more than one podcast and I'm usually confused. Uh, Lance, you're my (laughs) co-host. How are you Uh doing today? How are you? You sleep? Yeah. Yeah, fair enough. So you haven't started school yet, though, right? Uh, Duquesne started this week and CMU starts next week. So I have to go over to, yeah, it's all, it's all, it's all falling down around my shoulders. It's all, I'm already behind. <laughs> I hasn't even started. I'm behind already. Oh, gosh. When's spring break? So today, <laughs> today, today's episode is a return guest. This is Joanna Hersey, who, her uh, unofficial title is just tuba badass and badass woman um, and, uh, and and a friend of ours. Don't judge her. Um, but uh, her official title is that she is the professor of tuba and euphonium at uh, UNC Pembroke. And she is back on to talk to us about um, she is the president of the International Women's Brass Conference. And um, they just had their... Uh, 25th anniversary conference was earlier this summer, and uh, she joined us to talk all about that conference and about that nonprofit and about uh, women in the brass world and uh, women in the world in general. And uh, I found it to be a very illuminating conversation in spite of our uh, predictably non-super insightful questions. <laughs> oh, these so so they're here. that's just a little preview of something you got to come. See, we're uh, we have we're trying out a new platform, and uh, Andrew had the lack of foresight to allow me to initiate the call, which means that I'm in charge of the sound effects. Heaven so help us all. Of mad. He's sad and mad, all wrapped into one. He doesn't really know how to react. But if we want nice. some nifty outro music, hey, thanks for tuning in to the Brass Junkies podcast, podcast, podcast. All brass players all the time. You're going to hear about mouthpieces by Michael Barker. You're going to hear about the brass program at Duquesne University. And you'll certainly hear some trumpet jokes. <laughs> so there's a little something for you. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> what? What? <laughs> first, first of all, uh, if you're still listening to this, whoever you are, congratulations! Yeah, do, you, do, 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 threshold to pain. Uh, but uh, in all seriousness, it was a it was a really really wonderful conversation, uh, which you'll hear all about uh, how the idea for this conversation came up, and um, and talking about the podcast moving forward. Uh, and there's some really good stuff in there. The first thing I wanted to do before thanking Parker Mouthpieces, which I guess I guess it's somebody who makes uh, brass mouthpieces. I'm not positive, but um, I'll read the I'll read the blurb. Maybe it'll become clear. But we uh, recorded a little bonus episode, a brief bonus episode, where we asked Joanna some funny questions right after her appearance, which is going to be for our Patreon patrons only. And uh, that is going to be, uh, you will hear that. So it's not only a brief conversation with Joanna, but then uh, Lance and I talking about uh, what we thought about uh, about the episode, just some thoughts about that. So that is going to be available for our Patreon patrons only. So um, if you go to patreon.com slash the brass junkies, I believe, right? Is that correct? Yes. Then you can, uh, then you can, you, you can know that. pledge a dollar, two dollars. Uh, we've even got uh, one ten dollar per episode, and that helps us uh, with our our costs and with uh, which are which are which are actually pretty sizable, believe it or not. And uh, it just helps us to uh, to keep this thing moving forward. So thank you so much to everybody that's done that. And uh, to anyone who's listening to this in the future, uh, all of the bonus episodes uh, featuring questions with people, just, you know, bonus material in general will all be available to anyone who signs up at any point, including all the back 
uh, catalog of stuff. So you'll get a whole bunch of bonus things if you come and sign up. So yep. we currently have 22 patrons. We're currently making 52 bucks an episode, which is a huge help. Thank you so much. Yes. And we'd love to have uh, more of you join the fun. It would be awesome for us to get to 25 patrons uh, sometime soon. That's, I think, our, our next goal. So Well, and actually, we just learned that there's um, we there's a function. They just added a functionality to Patreon where we can host um, uh, little video chats with the patrons. So we're going to start looking at uh, bringing some additional material to those folks. The podcast itself, the mothership, is always going to continue to be free. Yes. That won't change, but uh, we do want to um, do some uh, extra stuff for yeah, the, the folks who are helping st- us out. The streaming thing sounds really cool. It's through YouTube, but it will be a private link that will only be available to patrons. So, uh, so we're going to be able to have some regular uh, direct uh, Q and A's with uh, with those mighty fine people. So, uh, and then uh, super quickly, Parker Mouthpieces. Uh, thank you to them for providing our hosting. Parker Mouthpieces offers fine, customizable component mouthpieces for horn, trombone, euphonium. Which uh, what is what is euphonium? Where, what's where does that word originate from, Lance? Well, the euphonium. Actually, I'm a bit of an entomologist, and uh, I did some research. I went to the dusty archives of uh, Greece, Athens, and I found out that the word euphonium is derived from the Greek word euphonos, which means unemployable. Fine, customizable component mouthpieces for horn, trombone, euphonium, and tuba, including... (laughs) <laughs> including the Andrew Hitz artist model tuba mouthpiece and the Lance LeDuc model euphonium mouthpiece. Find out more at parkermouthpieces.com or follow them on Facebook, Instagram, <laughs> and Twitter. So I guarantee you that I'm going to get a text message from Michael Parker of Parker Mouthpieces, who is my former roommate from college, one of my best friends, and it's just going to say, dude, <laughs> dude. All right. Uh, and then uh, tell uh, tell the folks about Duquesne. Hey, Duquesne University is a phenomenal brass program. It's a great school, great school of music. It's right in the heart of downtown Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And if you go to the show notes uh, for this episode and actually any of the episodes in the last six months or so, you will find a link which will direct you to the uh, Duquesne um Uh, website which has a page devoted to the brass area so you can learn about the brass faculty what sort of ensembles you can play in and all about the university so check that out thank you very much to jim nova for uh, helping make that happen and uh you remember jim you remember jim don't you uh yeah he's the star trek guy right he is the star trek guy yes exactly he he does a mean jean-luc he does. Well, I think, did he do Tron? Did he also do... I think so. I think so. And actually, Land of the Lost with the Slee Stacks. That was one of my favorite trombone overdubs that Jim did. The Slee Stacks were kind of scary. I didn't really understand what was happening in the Land of the Lost, but... <laughs> and I thought it was... Kind of like H.R. Puffin it was, stuff. It was, it was weird when he started weird. rapping. It was also really kind of a little odd, so... That's true. Good point. But anyway... All right. Well, without further ado, let's hey, get. Hey, but what about what if we wanted people to download the the episode through iTunes and maybe leave us a review or share the episode with their friends? See, Should they do that sort of thing? No, it would be terrible if you would leave us a review since we're trying to get more of those since it helps people find the podcast, uh, and then it feels <laughs> then it feels a little less like we're just <laughs> talking to ourselves. So, uh, yeah, that would that would be great uh, if you I, could. I take can the time already to do hear that. your irritation level go every time I give you one. I can just like seething. I can. Just I am initiating picture. every call from here on out. So, I'm gonna I'm gonna change the password and not tell him. I gotta get it in. Yeah. So My last chance. All right. This is going to actually. This is going to segue perfectly to the very awkward and chaotic, inter, like very first section with Joanna, and then that will segue awkwardly into an incredibly serious discussion about some really important and heavy stuff. So, um, but uh, it was awesome. Uh, yeah, we'll uh, we're you're going to enjoy it. I think so. It was really good, really good. In all seriousness, I think this is one of our better ones. Yeah, me too. So, um, yeah, because of Joanna, she's awesome. So. Uh, Dr. Awesome, Joanna Hersey. So without further ado, here is our conversation with tuba badass Joanna Hersey. And today we are joined on the Brass Junkies by a return guest who either had 
fun the first time she was interviewed or had nothing better to do this evening, or maybe both. Uh, Joanna Hersey, how are you? Uh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh goodness so i'll do my so, best to stop doing that but i have so, no promises so just uh yeah before uh enough out of joanna uh let's talk some more lance um the, we we <laughs> we have this has been a grave miscalculation because we have uh we're trying out a new platform uh with a hopefully the sound is good we're we're just trying you know we're always trying out new things but um, I have learned that I need to initiate the phone calls on this platform from now on because the person who does that has a <laughs> has an arsenal of sound effects at their disposal. And, <laughs> and, and, and currently, uh, the yeah we're, we're both we're both jackasses, but Lance yeah. Lance is extra jackass. This is like more. <laughs> this is more. <laughs> This is more slapstick than any intro we've ever done, and that's really bad. Like, uh, I, I wish there was a way that someone could like hit a button for when they download the podcast for the first time ever, and they don't make it through the introduction. <laughs> It'd be kind of <laughs> if you could just click here just to tell us how bad it really was. So, who's the guest again? It's uh, oh Joanna. How are you? Oh, I'm just wonderful. This is such an entertainment. You're gonna have to. You're gonna. <laughs> you're, you're gonna. You're gonna have to speak up. So, or else you're not gonna get a word in edgewise oh, between. Put the, <laughs> put the piano back on the dramatic, sad piano. There we go. Joanna, would you talk to us? No one else will. <laughs> it all started with a tuba. <laughs> This is, this is, I have a feeling that Tom Holtz just ran his car into a guardrail. That's like, that's my guess. I know, I know that, I know that we've gone completely off the rails when, uh, when I get an email from Holtz saying like, yeah, I almost drove off the road. So, um, so <laughs> Uh, it's it's rather ironic that um that that we that we are starting this episode like this because we're actually uh, here to talk about like some pretty important not pretty very important and uh, some pretty heavy stuff so it makes sense that we're starting this with just a with a potpourri uh, a poo poo platter of sound effects uh, and that. Uh, and that, and that we're four minutes into the interview and that we have we have let Joanna say, I think, like nine words and it maybe is seven. So, uh, yeah, good stuff. So, so, so Joanna, let's try and uh, let's try and corral this. Uh, can you uh, just in case anyone did not hear your first uh, appearance on the podcast, which like whatever. And they also live under a rock and don't know who you are since you basically do everything. You're one of the busiest people that I know in the entire brass world, which is saying something. Uh, in, if For that rare combination of person, can you give us a short version of who are you and what do you do? And if you were a tree, what kind of a tree would you be? <laughs> wow. Okay, so I'm going to go with the easy one first, which is that I carry tubas and euphoniums in and out of my car. And I play them in various locations. I am based in North Carolina. I teach at the University of North Carolina at Pembroke. And we've just started back this week. Today was the fourth day of class. So all of this hoopla is probably appropriate. And so one of the things that I love to do is write. So that's an interest of mine. And women, brass players and women's bands is something that I like researching the historical aspects of. And I tour with chamber music. I've just become a member of the Seraph Brass, which is a brass quintet. And so I'll be touring a lot more with them. And I'm the president of a pretty cool organization. What organization would that be? It is the International Women's Brass Conference. Very cool. So that might be what we want to talk to you about. It could be. It could be. Lance, you, you have so this, this summer. You have, in a while. Well, I'm, I'm trying to um, hold it together. Good. I was a little upset because you were making fun of me, and I didn't. I got a little emotional, and I, I didn't really know how to. You, you do not get upset when people make fun of you. That's like trying to put out a grease fire with a squirt gun. It just makes it just go, go. No, brighter. it really affected me, and I thought that this was an opportunity for me to show a softer side of myself. But then maybe not. 
All right. So what were you saying, Lance, this summer? This summer, you guys uh, just had the, what annual IWBC was that? It was the 25th anniversary conference. And How so, cool is that? Yeah, we were looking back. And for me, it's, and I'm one of those people, I think things are meant to be. And that when we cross a path and all of that, I'm one of those. I'm from Vermont and we went over that already. So that's, that's the tree hugger side of me. So when I was just starting out, and many of us might remember that we talked about, I came from Arizona State and Parentoni Studio, and I joined the Coast Guard Band. And that was the same year that the IWBC was founded and hosted its first conference. And so because I was newly in the Coast Guard Band, I was the second woman tubist in the Premier Service Bands. And so Jan Duga, who was in the Air Force Band, she was the first she called me and said, you know, we finally have two and we can make a tuba euphonium quartet. And there's this new conference that's been founded in St. Louis and it was 1993. And so I went and I went never having been exposed to any kind of art in the brass field that was made by any women. It was all male and there it was happening. I was from Vermont. I didn't see any of it. <laughs> we missed it all. So I got to go at the age of 20 and it was just blown away. And there was all kinds of great performances from both men and women, but I got to hear Abby Conant and I got to hear the Monarch Brass and I was 20 and it, I came back just completely wowed and changed by that. And so ever since I've gone to them, the IWBC saves up and does conferences every two or three years rather than having them every year. So it's something that there haven't been 25 of them, but it's been 25 years. And so to be able to come out onto the stage in New Jersey, we held it at Rowan University, to be able to come out and welcome everyone to the 25th anniversary as president, when I remember and I looked out and I saw all those college students that were there for the competitions and that might have had chamber groups there. And I remember being in that chair and it, it was one of those old fogey moments because I, I just... I saw that all come back around and, and it meant a lot to me to be able to be leading it. Wow. That's awesome. So how big of a conference is it? Well, it varies. I'd say we probably had something along the lines of 300 registrants maybe. So it was uh, Monday, Tuesday. I think the competition started on Tuesday and it went through a Saturday night. So almost a week. And we had vendors and people that came for the day, but it would, was small enough that one music building could hold it all. Unlike a, a larger, massive thing like Midwest or something like that, you were able to see and speak with everybody through the course of the week. And so I liked that about it. We were able to have just a couple of things happening at any one time so you could go to things, which was good. So it feels more friendly. And if somebody's not been to a conference before, I, I think it's nice because it's not so overwhelming. And who was the organizer this year? I mean, you said Rowan, but who was uh, who put the thing together? Right. There are three site hosts who who did awesome. Amy Shoemaker Bliss and Brian Appleby Weinberg, the euphonium and trumpet professors, and Lindsay Wilson, who is the horn person there, and Rowan University staff and students helped us. So they were the site hosts. And then members of the board of directors of the IWBC Jan Duga and Amy Cherry were our liaisons. And then we run lots of different committees. So you could serve on a committee if you wanted. And the competition committee, for example, took care of all of that. I was the chair of the awards committee. So we divide up the work so that it's not so overwhelming for any one group. So they were great. The Rowan University is in New Jersey. So it was an easy East Coast place for us. And it was great. So how far in advance, what I'm trying to get at is what goes into the planning for an event like this? Um, I, the naive, uh, not naive, the stupid white male question is, well, what's different about a women's brass conference than a brass conference? And that's a good question. And it's not that everything needs to be different because there were men there performing and presenting and there were women there performing and presenting. And there is going to be seminars on the Alexander technique and lecture recitals on how to write, you know, how to write a program notes or resumes. But one of the things that struck me in 1993 when I went is that alongside all of that regular stuff and brass quintets playing Bach and Robert King and all the stuff that you would expect, there was a seminar on pregnancy and brass playing in 1993. And I remember going and there weren't any tubists. 
there, hmm. there weren't really any that were there that had ever had a child and been a performer while that happened. And there are some, but they just weren't there. And so I remember thinking, well, this doesn't help. <laughs> we have trumpet and horn players. And so that's been a feature. So, so yeah, there's a great seminar on taxes and the music business, but then there'll be somebody who is talking about the kind of healing aspects. There was a great presentation on somebody who'd been through some trauma and how they had used music to get themselves out of the trauma. That, that was sort of um, a feminine-based... So it's not that everything is, but some of it is, and that's more unusual. Mm -hmm. Well, if we maybe back out a level, what is, uh, I understand that a lot of these questions are sort of dumb, basic softballs, but what's the purpose of the organization? I mean, what is the, how, and the other part of it would be, how would you know that you won or not won? How would you know that you achieved your goals? No, that's a great idea. Uh, great question. And so what happened was, Many of us might know the name Susan Slaughter, who for many years played principal trumpet with the St. Louis Symphony. She's a wonderful dynamo. And it was her idea to start this all in the first place. And interestingly, looking back for 20, from 25 years, this is the ni early 90s, she got some pushback that we didn't need to have an organization that just talked about one of the genders. And it may do more harm than good people were afraid that if you focused and drew attention, and that's still true today, if you draw attention to it, then you're just reminding everyone and maybe it's better to go along quietly. So there were, there were some people who didn't want to go and present at it, for example. Hmm. And, but her goal has always been that she wants to get the faces out there. And so to inspire people not to quit, there's a high percentage of young women that quit brass playing, for example, or that quit education after it wasn't what they expected or had been led to, led to believe. And so she wanted to inspire people to stay in it and to showcase what can happen, showcase the great artists, and then to offer help. So there's a scholarship and a competition piece, and they're all open to young men and, and young women both, but that it would be especially marketed so that we would hope that girls would feel comfortable coming in. The auditions are all blind for the first rounds. Um, so you have judges that are a good cross section. So she, Susan Slaughter would say if she were on this interview with us that she just wanted to start a discussion and that she wasn't intending for it to replace iTex or anything like that, but it would just be an added way to remind everyone that there is a little bit of work to do in the area of gender and race, especially in classical music and in jazz. Well, what a powerful thing for a 20 year old Young woman, even though you already had a, a job, I don't care, you know, you, you, 20 years old is young, to be able to walk into that environment and see all of that happening. I talk, there's, as a, uh, as a straight white male my entire life, there's an awful lot that I have taken for granted. And the fact that I grew up watching the Boston Symphony and that virtually the entire brass section looked exactly like I do, just older, and that I'd go see the Canadian Brass and they looked exactly like I do, and I'd go to see Empire Brass, they look exactly like I do. Um, and, you know, that's something that never, ever crossed my mind when I was a kid. But, but boy, how, how powerful was that when you were there and were surrounded by people who looked like you and didn't look like me? That's right. And the idea of seeing yourself, seeing your face in them, and you can do that without it because any of us that are over a certain age probably did it without it. I didn't know there were, there are women to a players. Connie Weldon was, was around when I was just starting out, but I didn't ever meet or see her as a young student. So it's, it's possible, but you, you would rather that we showed everything. So that was Susan. And Susan is one of these people who is very quiet and unassuming. And until she has a trumpet in her hand and she's playing Mahler or something, she's, she's calm and she's one of the people that won't speak up right away. And she's very quiet and dignified. And for somebody like that to feel so strongly really shows, I think, the importance of it. So she hosted a conference in St. Louis. It was a roaring success. And then we all had a network. We had, and it was a book because back in the day, <laughs> you didn't have the internet. 
So you connected, there was a membership book, just like the, the ITEA journal, the tuba journal used to be a book that you could look up names in. And, and so, right, the Women's Brass Conference had, so you could look up by state and see who was there if you were interested in getting mentored or having a lesson. And I thought that was neat. And so then she's kept going with them. And when I got asked to be on the board, which was about three years ago, that was one of the most exciting things that had ever happened to me because it was my chance. And of course, you don't understand what's about to happen to you when you join a nonprofit and begin to run one. <laughs> because if you did, nobody would do it. But right. <laughs> it, it's wonderful to the cross section of people that I have met through it. So I'm so excited. And so Lance alluded to this in his question about how long out are we planning and what are we thinking about? So we've just finished in June. We're going to have the next one in 2019. So that's two years. And we're already in the full planning stages for that. So it'll take the next two years to get that conference off the ground and running. And that's the most exciting thing of all about this call is that it is at Arizona State. Hey. So Deanna Swoboda will be hosting that. And she hosted one for us when she was at Western Michigan. So she's a veteran conference host. And so I'll still be president. And I'm very excited to go back to my alma mater and lead us through one more. So that's going to be great. That's awesome. So how so 25 years is a good amount of time. Um, what, <laughs> He's trying how not, has trying the, not to say that I'm old, right? Okay. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm older than you. So it, 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 it's, it's all good. I think, uh, I think you're both old. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> In what way or ways, if any, has the conversation changed in 25 years? Well, it's interesting because we, some instruments are kind of headed over the line faster than others. Like horn, today, really, it's not that unusual for people to see a woman playing horn as a college professor or in an orchestra or military band. It's up to something like 28% in the nation's orchestras. It's not as strong as principal. Principal horn is only at something like 10% for our nation's top orchestras. Mm. But, but the horn has really crossed over. And that's something that you really don't get surprised. I, I always think back to auditions where we, we're so careful. Right? I was in the military. And we are so careful in auditions, you're going to have a screen. And you're going to have carpet down, maybe, so that the person can walk to their chair without you hearing the click of shoes. And or you maybe ask the candidates to take their shoes off. So you're, you're very careful about that. And I remember when we stopped doing that for Horn about the shoes, because it was more than half women. And we decided at that point, we probably didn't need to worry about the shoes. Mm -hmm. It's not the shoes. Right. Wow. <laughs> so, so how to well, just to stay with that. So what's what are those ratios look like or, or which one has been at the end, the back of the pack in terms of advancement well it's interesting because they're all about the same trumpet and trombone and tuba are all sitting around three to five percent nationally and this this is orchestra um now we've gotten some major players that like harold jansh in the philadelphia orchestra that's tipped the public's eye so like she's in my i teach you a section of music appreciation and she and Allison Balsam are both in my music appreciation textbook, which is awesome. They show pictures of them during when they're talking about what brass instruments are. So that textbook has done a good job of shifting gears. So the, the other ones are slower to shift. It's sort of like flute. It's interesting for the woodwinds. Flute has turned predominantly women as far as our orchestras and bands in the U.S. But clarinet and bassoon have been slower. I think clarinet is only something like 17% female, where flute is 68. So, you have any fear? I mean, what, what, what's going on there? Is there any, how do you interpret that? Yeah, and it's interesting because today we wouldn't think we'd be so tied to the, the, the scholarship. And I know that's, I'm sorry to use that word on this podcast. <laughs> It's all right. We don't know what it means but anyway. It's fine. I, I, hey, I, is that? I was, right? Okay. Is that just because I called you old? Come on now. Right. Come on now. Okay. Take the high road, Joanna. Take the high so, road. Some people say, how's that? Some people say that <laughs> the lower and larger instruments, because they don't match the female voice, can seem more disconcerting to people. And that is maybe why the higher instruments, violin, flute, 
tend to be easier for people to, to see as feminine. They are higher pitched. And so the higher brass, that doesn't work, though, because I think trumpet's so strident that it cancels itself out. <laughs> so, uh, high, but it's right. strident. <laughs> Good job. <laughs> uh, well, do you think, I mean, I'm thinking about how, you know, I guess we're about the same age. So the band, the guys who were band directors and they were primarily, well, actually they were all guys, all the ones that I knew, save St Stacy Detkin, who was uh, a legend, still is a legend, <clears throat> but there weren't that many uh, female band directors around. And many of the band directors I knew, fortunately not the two I had in high school, um, were chauvinists. And so the notion that a girl could carry a tuba even, or could put out enough wind to play a euphonium or a trombone, my, that's my working theory as to where the right. blank holery uh, came in. <clears throat> There's this preconceived notion that it, it was physically impossible. Yeah, there's sort of a macho culture with trombone, and, well, I don't know, maybe that's the wrong example, with trumpet that doesn't exist with flute or clarinet. So mm -hmm. we, we do see the, the brassiness and it's louder. It's also the war instruments, right? The brass. So, so whatever all of these combine in our brains and our expectations, we see it as being difficult and needing a lot of force. And it's just been, it's lagged behind a little bit. And that's why it's cool to have these conferences because if you happen to think oh, I don't know about piccolo trumpet and some lovely young woman. You don't need to hang out there for very long before your expectations are, are blown away. We have some amazing high brass players. The ensembles are one of the cool things about the conference for me because you see an entire stage full of like the Athena brass band, which I play in. So that's a British style brass band. And so the entire percussion, everything is all women and it's, handpicked from all the different brass bands so it's all people who sit mostly in male sections and then they come to that and it's a nice break it's not real it's just exists for that four days but it is unusual so I think that was part of Susan's point was there she was she's playing every day in St. Louis mostly by herself and if we could get together once in a while and have a cup of coffee and, and talk about it that might make it easier. And she was right. We're still doing it 25 years later. So it was a good idea. So cool. So do you get people, uh, do you get people who tell you to your face that having a women's brass conference is, is stupid or unnecessary? I mean, I remember last November for international women's day when if you searched Twitter for the number of uh, deep thinkers, scholars, uh, who were saying, "Where's you know, where's the International Men's Day?" and then it was fun seeing the millions of replies saying, "Do you have Google, you stupid piece of uh, person?" Uh, because there actually is one. Um, but uh, but anyway, uh, do do people tell that to your face, or is it just kind of because there's absolutely people who still think that? I'm just wondering how upfront they are about being honest about that opinion. Yeah, I think that that's one of those things that social media, because you don't really have to say it to someone's face. So people will comment a lot under my posts, the when is there going to be a men's brass conference to which I do, don't reply. But the answer to that is every other one. Of course. And, and so it, and not that women like me don't play at every eye tech, but it's just still sure. going to predominantly be. Of course. Right. So the the people that, and then there's there's two answers to that which i think is interesting there's the group that is probably older that doesn't understand the situation that our young people are facing with these macho maybe the the macho band director setting and they don't understand that so they don't think it matters but then there's also young people who have been privileged enough not to have experienced any that they understand anything directly keeping them from doing anything. So I've noticed that there's a set of younger people that also think this isn't necessary because we've fixed everything that's wrong with our gender and race relations, which I see. all of our local latest news will tell you is not the case. So I think that until these people go under the, the promotion committee at, at their job, or there's some kind of, situation they don't realize 
that it's a concern. They don't realize they should pay attention. Hmm. Well, so what, as an organization, what are you doing to contribute, other than the events, how are you contributing to that dialogue and trying to um, mentor it, I guess, for lack of a better term, usher it forward, get further down the road and keep it a part of the conversation? Right. And, and I like to think that part of our mission is that down the road, it, that we use the term broader musical world. So gender and race and the genres, right, that we won't keep um, classical music on top of the other genres, the mu women tend to participate more in other genres. And so all of those things will become less defined in the future, that we can take everything by who it is and not by stereotypes. And so one of the things we have, which I like is, because I'm an academic as well, I teach, I'm a college professor, we have an academic mentoring program. And so members can connect, there's a map, there's two maps. One of them is the academic mentoring one. And so if you're in school as a student and you're doing a project or you need some advice or you feel that you don't know what to do, there's a way for you to click and contact people like me who've said it's okay for my info to be up there as an academic contact. So providing that networking, which may not be in a person's perspective right at the moment. There's also an educational outreach component. So we are sending people into the schools to do clinics. That's something that I think many organizations do. That's not unique to us, but we're sending women. And so we're making sure that that is happening in the elementary and middle and high school levels. And then also the scholarships for the people to compete. There's scholarship programs for all of our competitions at the conference. So if somebody doesn't have the funding to register, because you of course have to register for the conference if you're going to join the competition and that costs a bit of money and not everybody can do that. So there are programs set up where they can apply for scholarships and work at the conference and get free registration and, and that sort of thing. Well, here, here's a spectacularly stupid question. Is, the, <clears throat> is there an underlying goal of obsolescence? In other words, do you hope that 25 years from now that there's no longer the International Women's Brass Commerce because there's no longer a need for the International Women's Brass Commerce? Or is there, or, I mean, is that a thing that is on anyone's mind or is that just sort of we're just going to continue to go and we'll figure out? No, the, the hope would be, I think it's going to be longer than 25 years, but the hope would be that we That's would not have any problems with gender and trumpet anymore at some point or another and then the organization would turn ourselves onto other issues of inequality sure. that that is the idea so across the world um, issues of education and things that affect women like clean water and all of that sort of thing that the broader earth might need minds to set set to so that, well, that is our that's thought. really interesting. And are you dipping your toes in that in those waters yet, or is this a sort of down the road conversation? Let's put this fire out and then and then keep moving. Yes, and it's down the road. But I think the things that we're trying to use to further this one might be what helps the next one. So it's it's committees of like minded people. We're st we have a young person's council. So trying to get the younger students that again, may not quite realize why it matters. And all of the people that founded the women's brass conference 25 years ago, aren't going to be doing it forever. And we're going to need to pass the torch. So the idea of reminding people, what is the problem and showing them how it works and then brainstorming together. So, and I think that's, that's what all organizations, so all nonprofits mm -hmm. need. <clears throat> Less a conversation of um, women brass player issues and more a question of women's issues and, and that brass playing women is a subset of that. And so as issues of gender and race and inequality and sexual orientation are discussed and uh, hopefully progress is made, then the water rises. Is that right? I think fair? Yeah. And we live in a place where people don't look at each other always and see the person. Well, we're taping this at a very interesting time, yeah. but we'll just kind of sidestep that and keep moving. <coughs> <laughs> well, well played, Lance. <laughs> Yowzers. Yeah. Yeah, I, I so could un a, unload, yeah. but I'm not going to. More important than ever. And it might be, 
it might seem antiquated, right? We, we fixed horn, surely trumpet can't be that far behind. But if you think that horn is was fixed also, yeah, at it, less than 30%, 28%, right? But at least people see that as sort of both genders now. So, but trumpet should have come along with and didn't, right? So, right. And it's fascinating. Wow. And it's, isn't it? I mean, it's not, I don't mean this in any way to sound like I, like I'm surprised by this or ever have been, but it's just, it's crazy how slowly things change. It's just, it's just crazy. My, my dad uh, grew up in Florida. My dad is 76 and, you know, he, he vividly remembers, uh, you know, like two drinking fountains at, yeah. at, you know, at, at gas stations, um, growing up and and those days are are you know the of two drinking fountains are long behind us and yet here we are uh you know after what we're like a week and a half after a massive uh you know neo-nazi rally right down the street from me here in virginia right. not far uh, from me in north carolina right right and so uh, yeah so there there may not be two uh water fountains anymore but uh, it's just, it's incredible how, you know, as much as things change, the more they stay the same, which is why, and Lance totally threw the 25 year as a, just a random number. And as you said, uh, you know, you think it's going to take a lot longer than that. I'd, I would be shocked if 25 years from now, if all of this was, was behind us. I mean, it's just, it's just depressing how slowly things move. But thank goodness there are people like you and your organization who are, uh, who are not just <laughs> cynical about everything. Because that's kind of my, I mean, I can, uh, I'm trying not to be these days. I'm trying to, um, oh, you know, no. try, trying to, trying to, to um, institute small changes in my life and whatever to try and make the world a better place. But, but boy, the easy thing to do is just to get cynical and to just kind of say, well, this is how it's going to be. But thank goodness uh, there are organizations like yours that are not doing that. And we had a cool moment at the conference. One of the things, this was a big deal to me. Um, we gave an award to the conductor and music director of the Baltimore Symphony, Marin Alsa, and she came to Rowan University and accepted the award from me, and many pictures were taken. It was awesome. And she gave an acceptance speech, and she said something right along those lines, which I thought was really great. And she's been conductor, and again, this we're talking about brass, but it's that larger thing people who are women who happen to conduct, to direct in choir or in band or compose or any of the facets of music, produce, whatever it is. So she has a, a veteran conductor. She conducts in Sao Paulo. She conducts Baltimore. And she's been around a while. And she was given an award from us because by chance in 1996, Marin conducted the very first Monarch Brass. The Monarch Brass is a brass choir. Susan Slaughter thought, well, we should have a brass choir that can go around on tour and show people what we're about and advertise and, and show these orchestra players. So Marin Alsop was the very first conductor, and they put together maybe an eight- or ten-piece brass choir, and they went on a tour, and Marin conducted in 1996. So she was part of the organization from almost the beginning. So at 25th anniversary, we gave her a nice award. And in her speech, she said that something that I thought was fascinating about that passing of time. She said when she first began conducting, she thought, well, this will now there will be lots of women here soon. And she said, well, five years went by and 10 years went by and then 20 years went by. And she looked around and she said, why isn't anybody here with me? I seem to be mostly all alone. And then she realized, she said, that she was supposed to do it. Mm -hmm. So she's wow. founded a conducting institute and she's working with inner city Baltimore students. And so she, she reminded us to get up out of our seats. Right. Wow, that's powerful. Yeah. Well, if Andrew and I want to get up out of our seats, what, what do you tell dumb white dudes? <laughs> well, I, I would say that you're not dumb first of uh, all well we're not scholars either so it's the people that are in the gray area in between <laughs> <laughs> so but you guys are teachers and i think us we are many of us that are musicians also teach whether it's in our living room to the seventh graders whether it's at a school or the collegiate level, the high school level, I think we really have to make sure that we're not accidentally doing anything like saying to our young woman, are you sure you want to play sousaphone or whatever? 
and making sure that the young men feel free to choose if they want to play something like the flute, because it's starting to go the other way a little bit. We do see some, some gender segregation by the opposite way, too. And sometimes band directors tell me that they, they will get a parent who says their son won't play flute. Their son's not going to play, play a, a sissy instrument like that. So we, we do see it both ways, but it's, it's not as much the other way. So I think as teachers, we can look for places to educate and look for the instrument that truly catches the student's eye and the magic that catches the student rather than what they think they should play because they tend to go in groups, the young, and <laughs> try to single that out. And as parents, we can look for places with our own children to try to reset that gender expectation what does that mean? Is a principal of an elementary school always a woman? Is it going to be a man? Is the music teacher always a woman? And talk about that. I think that we, you, there's, we, we learned that this week with the, um, the idea of sheet caking and then going to Boston Common and holding up a placard, right? You can do either. Um, it's fine if you don't go to Boston Common and hold up a placard, but you're going to live your life in such a way that shows everyone around you that belief system that you have. And that's just that you have to be open to what people are and not what you think they are. Okay. So now that that's awesome. Um, for, I'm going to put you on the spot. We're going to go kind of case by case. So that is awesome for the, the band director or the music educator who is, um, assigning instruments now talk to the young talk to my son who's a sophomore going to be a sophomore trombone player in the uh, high school band or high school orchestra so how is he a good colleague what what is he doing potentially that's upsetting to his colleagues or that he's clueless about or that he should have on his mind that maybe he doesn't. I got a good one, so I don't mean to throw him under the bus because he's a really good I dude. know you do. I'm just using him as an example. In spite of playing the trombone and of being <laughs> your son, he's both yeah. intelligent <laughs> and a gentleman. It's, yeah, it's shocking. Craziness. Well, one of the things that I think that we can use, especially with teenage boys, because they tend to be the bulk of the brass sections in our high school bands and, and orchestras and jazz bands, I would say find a way to get those girls into some leadership in the ensemble. If there happens to be a girl in the trombone section or in the trumpet section or playing bass or whatever it is, is there a way that a leadership task can be given to that young woman? She may not be principal or section leader, but is there a committee? Is there a way, is there a job that can give her a chance to try some leadership because I think leadership is connected to this. The opportunities, young men who are gifted constantly have leadership opportunities come at them and they get used to that and they shoulder that. They grumble about it, but they'll do it. And sometimes young women are shyer and sit back. And young women who haven't led through four years of high school music are going to be hard pressed to survive a a competitive collegiate music program. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, and so when they get there, let's just take it another step. You kind of dodged it because you talked to, that was another one about that (laughs) my son can't do anything about putting that girl in a leadership role. But it's like she's not even listening. Okay, no, (laughs) not that the band director puts her in leadership. Your son does it. He organizes a sectional that she leads or that he watches and sees if she never speaks up and he can go to her and make her feel welcome in the section. That makes sense. That's it. That's we will it. we will grant the point. <clears throat> okay. <laughs> Thank you. So, so uh, now now this is now you're talking straight at me. Okay, Lance. Um, and and pin my ears back. I have uh, I have eleven euphoniums, five at Duquesne, six at CMU, and it's um, the breakdown is three and two and three and three. So it's five women and four men. So how am I, um, what's my charge to be a good steward to these five young women and to the six young men who need to understand how to um, try and make it less than 25 years? Okay, one of the things is about dress and dress code. Try to remember that all women don't 
necessarily dress or want to dress the same. So I notice dress codes a lot that, that assume, for example, that a young woman would want to wear a dress or feel comfortable in a dress. And there is a group of people for whom that's not their thing. So be encouraging of their style. If it's a more masculine style for a young woman, that is what she is and what she should do. So it's a little thing, but make sure that they feel comfortable with whatever the dress code is and that it's something that works for them. Also, ask the kind of rep. You need to teach them the regular rep. They need to know all of the stuff. They need to have played Spark. They need to, right, they need to know their regular stuff. But are we programming women in, in minority compositions? Are we exploring compositions from the rest of the ethnomusicology? Are we working with African drumming? Are we doing Pacific Island? Are we showing them the breadth outside after they've learned the Vaughn Williams tuba concerto and after they can play Spark? I think it's nice if we can include composers that reflect what the studio is, right? The, the different racial makeup and gender makeup of the studio. And then I would say the same thing about the leadership there, especially in the band world. And I teach in the South, so it's easier for men to speak up. I look for opportunities to put the girls into one of the things that I do. And I have all boys this year um, in Tube Euphonium at Pembroke. Uh, I use the ITEA chapters as a way to do that. I'll make sure that everybody chairs a committee. I, I make up committees. So there's there's an Oktoberfest committee and a guest artist committee and various committees and then the officer positions. And that can be in NAFME and any number of things. You maybe go the extra mile with the people. And we talked about this the last time we got together because people often ask me how I teach my women and female and male students differently. And I really don't teach them by a line of gender but I go much more on personality, and I'm talking about the sort of more laid back person and then the person who's a go-getter. Sometimes the woman's the go-getter and the, the young man might be more laid back, but whoever it is that's laid back may not be getting the full experience. And those people I would want to work in leadership positions on campus, get them involved with groups that reflect their, if, if there's a gay and lesbian group on campus, get them involved with that, see how you can make them feel comfortable. Perfect. Yeah, that, that's those, a great prescription set. Yeah, those are those are great. Yeah, as I as I'm sitting here thinking about this, you uh, you know, and there are a lot, as I think you mentioned, there are a lot of elementary and middle school band directors who are uh, female, uh, like my my wife. Most of them are not nearly as good as my wife is, but um, but I'm I'm unbiased. Uh, but then. High school here in um, here in Fairfax County, which is r incredible band programs. There's 25 high schools, and there are three female, um, you know, high school band directors, um, and uh, and all three of them um, are uh, Melissa, Kathleen, Kelly are all fantastic, but 22 of them are, you know, there's a there's an 88 percent chance that your son or daughter, if you grew up in Fairfax County, is going to have a male band director as your high school. Um, it's the same thing with studio teachers, where of course there's. There's the you and the and the Deannas and the Jamie Liptons and there's you know there's there's some um, some great examples uh, but but there's an awful lot more people that look like uh, Lance and I uh, and it's just everywhere you turn is um, yeah is is not just men but white men everywhere and so um, the concept of uh, creating a committee just to put them in a position of power where they're where they're heard because it's it's infinitely more important that a student feel like they're being heard rather or rather feel like they have the ability to be heard rather than them rather than for them to technically have the ability to be heard and uh, I think it's all how they perceive it and uh, the the specific steps that you just talked about are a very proactive way to help facilitate that and help them to become the leaders that uh, that they can be. But none of us who have any leadership qualities developed any of them before we just did it a whole bunch. So, right. yeah, it's so important. And one of the things that this is bringing up, too, is that we've talked about this a lot, and then you on the TEM podcast, too, that the music degree never really had all this extra stuff in it. <laughs> yeah, that's a very nice way to put that, Joanna. We're, I'm trying to do it. We're trying to add it. You're trying to showcase why it matters. This this business of music, which we all had to just learn on the job, it would be nice if some of that was told to them ahead of time. Amen. 
Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And and to take things even further, I I've talked about this in just in class after class after class, uh, you know, around the country at universities in terms of the fact that it's the most exciting time in history to be a content creator and that not that long ago that there were these gatekeepers and the gatekeepers decided who could make an album that would actually get distributed to more than 10 people and they decided who got to write a book and they got they decided all of that stuff and every single one of the gatekeepers was was a straight white male <laughs> like an old straight white male they all looked exactly the same and that's where all the power brokers were and uh, thankfully those people are no longer there uh, well, they're still there. They're, they've just been largely marginalized compared to where they were just because of the, you know, the proliferation. I bet you didn't think I knew that word, Lance. The proliferation of, uh, you know, of high-speed Internet um, in so many areas of the globe. Uh, and, th- and thank God that's the case, that, that you know, that, that those people don't possess that power. Some people used it absolutely, uh, you know, in a uh, in a manipulative and mean spirited way. They wielded that power. Others didn't intend to do it, but but still, the you know, it was there. So thank goodness we so we have to empower the uh, you know the 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 people who have not been who have been disproportionately represented in all of those books, albums, etc. Throughout, you know even just recent history, we have to empower them with the skills to be able to take advantage of the fact that those gatekeepers no longer have everything under lock and key. So, um, yeah, people that get to study with people like you who are encouraging them to become the leaders that they can and also equipping them with the skills to be able to move forward and be creative and change the world in some way, uh, whatever way they choose to do, uh, they're they're awfully lucky to 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 cross paths with somebody like you. You should teach more students. You should have like forty yeah. or forty or fifty or sixty. That's what I think. You know, it's I agree. it's interesting. And one thing we haven't talked about yet, which matters, is the aspect of family. And so you say that, and something happened today, which was that I read a social media post from one of my students who has been teaching now for 12 years, a music education tuba student that I had, and it's a young woman. And so you were saying that the ratio of band directors and music educators is sadly tilted towards the male in all levels. But this young woman has been teaching for 12 years, and she posted that she is quitting music education and not returning to teaching. Mm. And it made me sad, although I respect her. And of course, she is, again, she's exercising leadership in that decision. But she has children. And I think that that is what happens to many. Not everyone has the luxury of of not working outside the home when they have children. But if you can arrange your life to where that is a possibility, I think that we see less women in the band leadership because they're just not willing to, to give up one thing or the other, and that that creeps back into the conversation. Hmm. Well, well what, no, no, I was just this, this whole I'm, thing, I'm, not that this is news, but the whole thing is just so complex. Everything, there's just so many yeah. layers to, to all of these issues. They're all so intertwined, and that's why it just makes me want to but like start punching windows out when people say like, well, when are we going to get a men's conference? I mean, there's just, there are, yeah, there are lots of these issues and your, your, you know, combination of whatever you're dealing with is unique to you literally in all of humanity. It's just, but there's a commonality when, you know, that a lot of you who attended that conference are, are dealing with the same type of people, same type of personal struggles, et cetera. And so it's just so it's so incredible that you have that outlet and that you've been able to be put in a leadership role because somebody at some point in your past told you, hey, Joanna, go run this thing. And uh, and that you did it and learned from your right. mistakes, et cetera. And and now you're now you're president of, uh, of a really wonderful nonprofit. So thank you for your work. Oh, you're welcome. I feel like there is so much left to do so I could use all the help. So uh 
I wanted to uh, mention that uh, I wanted to thank Josie Conklin, who is a listener to the Brass Junkies, and she sent us an email back on June 11th, which was in a direct response to your appearance on the podcast, uh, which was uh, episode 60. And it was entitled Brass Junkies uh, number 60 slash women and brass. And uh, she in... um, she didn't pull any punches, but she did it in a very fair way. And I first, I just thank her if she's listening for taking the time to write to us two jackasses to begin with. But she pointed out um, that that we that you were only the sixth woman that we had on the podcast. There, there, there were 60 episodes. So, and a couple of those were return guests. JD's been on like 15 times. Um, but, uh, but, you know, and a couple of those were just Lance and I, but we had had over 50 guests and that six of them were women. And she then further pointed out that uh, four of the six women uh, were between episodes nine and 17. And um, and and we we immediately we we have to there's nothing we can do but fall on our own sword there and just admit that it wasn't a coincidence that we had four women, you know, which still I'm not trying to make it sound like four out of 17 is a lot either. It's not. But 25 percent is a lot bigger than a uh, number than 10 percent, which is where we were at. And now it's lower than 10 percent. So because you only count once. Uh, since you're you're a return guest and you're going to be episode 66 or whatever it is, um, but the you know in the beginning we we for sure made a concerted effort to make sure that it wasn't all white males that we interviewed, and so we we asked a number of people, and it's not like to be very clear, it's not like we could only think of four people. There's a we have a list of people that we want to be. Um, you know, that, that, that we either have approached and just haven't followed through on or that we're going to approach. But then uh, we, Lance and I, fell into it's It's been, uh, this is not to make an excuse, this is just a fact, that it's been challenging for us to, to schedule um, Lance and his family and his career, me and my family and my career, and a guest all at the same time. It can be kind of challenging. Um, and uh, as a result of that, we can kind of throw guests together. Um, certainly one of the we always batch them on Saturdays. We'll do three. We'll do one Saturday a month and we will do three interviews that, uh, you know, that morning. And then we take off the summer because uh, we're both just kind of traveling and it's just it's hard to pin people down in the summer. But uh, whenever we would fill in, you know, 95 percent of this business, therefore, 95 percent of our direct colleagues are, all look exactly like us. So the thought is, well, yeah, let's ask, uh, let's ask Mike Roylance, who hasn't been on the podcast yet. Um, and I was just hanging out with him the other day. Our kids were playing, and he's going to be. But the point is that that uh, that any time that we did that, it ended up almost always being a white male. And so we have to do better about that. But she she actually, uh, this will make you uh, very happy, Joanna. She, as a result of hearing your interview. She not only sent us a very uh, polite and uh, caring email telling us to get our act together, but she also uh, got in her car and drove like the next day to um, to the to the conference. And uh, and yeah, exactly. So and she's uh, and and I say this only in quotes. She's only an amateur trombone player, uh, which I think is even cooler. Um, you know, she's uh, her Google profile here says that she's like a chemist, I think. So, um, yeah, which is really, really great. But it's it's funny how when when Lance and I are not thinking, you know, when, when we're not intentionally thinking about it, that we end up. I, I saw the, the streak from 17. It was like 24 episodes or something later. It was almost a full year that we went between female guests between 17 and whatever the next one was in the um you know in the 40s so and we absolutely need to do better and we're going to and remember it's natural for people to form like-minded groups that's not harmful when you form groups with friends that you feel like-minded with that's why things like clubs on campus work well because it's like-minded people who are all alike But once in a while, we have to remember, like you're saying, to just step away from that and think, if I was the other type of student, where would I want to go? And what is the viewpoint? And how might it be different? And what value can these other groups bring? Right. Yep. 
Well, well Lance, I don't know that else? I'd let us off the hook. I don't know if I'd let us off the hook that easily. <laughs> That's a very nice thing to say, but uh, we just need you, to double I'll down. I'll send and be... you the IWBC membership roster, and you can start scheduling. <laughs> Great. Yeah, we we, 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 will, we will take it, and and we've uh, we really do have a um, a list. I've done better with TEM, uh, but that was because one day, and I don't remember what number that was, but I, I you know looked at the the list of people I'd interviewed, like the first twenty something, and I went, wait a minute, what? You know, it's like the, the my, my initial list. Of of just immediate colleagues that just kind of that popped into my mind right away were, yeah, they all looked exactly like me. <laughs> so, um, and I kind of was like, wait a minute, this is a big problem. So I've done better with TEM. I still need to do better, uh, you know, even better still with TEM. But um, there is, uh, it would be one thing if there just weren't that many incredibly talented, successful, and interesting female brass players who could make, you know, our podcast better than it should be uh as guests but there's like there's enough to fill literally years of the podcast without interviewing a single male so it's uh, not exactly like it's going to be a sacrifice we just have to uh, get our get our heads out of our collective um what are we a soft case that's what we'll say uh and uh and just pay attention to uh you know to to who we're asking and make sure that it's a representative of the world uh, at large and um and not reflecting the less than 10 percent percentage of the you know of of non-horn playing uh, female brass players in professional orchestras well uh is there anything else that you want to add joanna this has been awesome thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us about all of this really important stuff you're welcome i think that one thing that I would want to leave everybody with is that young people in general, but especially our young women and our minority students who might not have the same kind of support from everybody they meet, challenge them to take the risk. Don't, don't look at them and tell them to play it safe. Don't look at them and think, well, you're probably going to have kids in a couple of years, so you wouldn't need to go to that master's degree school. Don't put the family into it. Don't look at them and think about their finances. Tell them what they need to do to get to their goals without any of the extraneous stuff. Wow. That's pretty good. I like it. Where's my sad piano music? Well, hang on. We're got, I see. I have a special. I was oh, hoping that you might actually. I, I thought you might offer up some advice. You're so wise, Thanks. clearly. And we already have some advice for Jens. But in light of the conversation that we just had, maybe there's some direction you can point our Canadian friend in. <laughs> it's time for meditation. <laughs> Sit calmly, listening to a trumpet ensemble warm up of all women. Clear your mind. <laughs> Relax the facial muscles and don't think about Amish. That's beautiful. That's really beautiful. That's beautiful. See? Uh, uh, there you go. See, we were like I'm, deep. We were deep yeah. and we were like profound and we were doing, I, and then all of a sudden. Exactly. I like yeah. I like in the chat. Yeah, Lance said uh, Yen's advice, and then I wrote no question marks. It just didn't feel right. And then Lance said I'd say yes. I said okay, go for it. And then before it even happened, I knew I was like, here comes the piano. There it is. Yeah. <laughs> oh goodness. There you yeah. go. Well, uh, Joanna, thank you so much for being a return guest and for uh, sharing. Uh, with us all about your wonderful organization and the conference and uh, all of the issues that are facing you and all women and uh, the world in general today. Uh, just thank you so much for your time. Thank you guys. It's been a lot of fun. And that will do it for another episode of the Brass Junkies. You've been listening to the Brass Junkies on the Pedal Note Media Podcast Network. If you would like to help support the podcast in order to make more episodes like this one possible, please visit pedalnotemedia.com slash donate for more details. Also, be sure to check out our latest recording, The Brass Recording Project, at brassrecordingproject.com. The Brass Junkies is produced by Joey Santillo. 
Executive producers are Andrew Hitz and Lance LaDuke. This has been a presentation of the Pedal Note Media Podcast Network. Thank you.